Hi, my name is Michael Crawford. I'm a surgeon in Sydney, Australia. This video will describe sleeve gastrectomy. The information given in this video cannot replace the advice you can receive from your own medical practitioner. That being said, this video will describe briefly who might benefit from weight loss surgery and in particular a sleep gastrectomy, how a sleep gastrectomy is performed, the potential side effect of a leak from a sleep gastrectomy and what we can do to try and prevent that uh, potentially serious complication. We'll finish up with a video and a description of what happens after the surgery in terms of your diet. Weight loss surgery is generally considered for patients who have morbid obesity, which is a BMI of more than 40 or a BMI of more than 35 with a weight related health condition. Excess body weight is frequently referred to in weight loss surgery circles and refers to your current body weight minus your ideal body weight. There are two main types of weight loss surgery that are performed. One is a restrictive procedure, which includes the sleeve gastrectomy that we're going to concentrate on today, but also gastric banding, and the others are malabsorptive procedures. At surgery, a large part of the stomach is removed to create a new shape of stomach in the shape of a tube. The tube-shaped stomach causes a rise in pressure in the upper stomach, and this combined with the removal of the large part of the stomach which produces the appetite hormone ghrelin means that patients after sleep gastrectomy have much less interest in food and much less intense hunger. Furthermore, when they do eat, they're only able to eat a smaller amount of food in any one go. The sleep gastrectomy is performed under general anaesthetic, meaning that you're fast asleep. It's done with keyhole surgery using five small incisions. A liver retractor is placed to elevate the left lobe of the liver. Then the fat called the omentum is divided from the outside of the stomach. A sizing tube is passed by the anaesthetist into the stomach that tells me how close to go to the stomach that we're leaving behind. Then we staple through the stomach to separate the piece that we are going to remove and then I oversew the entire staple line before withdrawing the stomach that we're removing through a small incision in a plastic bag. This is a picture with the plastic protective coating that I use over the skin showing the umbilicus or the belly button in the lower part of the picture with the head towards the top and the five small incisions that we plan to make marked out in black. This diagram and photo show the line that we take to remove the fat from the outer side of the stomach. These pictures illustrate the line that the stapler will make. It usually takes six loads of a stapler to get all the way through. This picture illustrates what it will look like after the fat has been sewn to the stomach. This is a brief video demonstrating some of those crucial steps for the procedure. First, an incision is made just to the patient's left hand side and above their umbilicus or belly button. The laparoscope or camera is inserted through a port and this port is used under vision to gently separate the tissues until we're inside the abdomen. Once this has occurred, we can pump carbon dioxide gas in and pass the camera and other ports into the abdomen. Here is a five millimeter port used for one of our instruments going in. And this is the retractor that we use to hold up the liver to get it out of the way. Till this is done, we can't actually see the stomach, but now you can get a glimpse of that pinkness there, which is the stomach. Now we're demonstrating that there's no hiatus hernia present and beginning the procedure of dividing the omentum, which is the fatty layer on the right hand side of the picture, from the outer edge of the stomach. We do this by separating using a special machine here, which burns and cauterizes the blood vessels before passing a knife to cut through on either side. And we do this all the way up and all the way down the stomach until the amount of stomach that we wish to remove has been separated from the omentum. Here we're dividing some of the uh, little adhesive uh, areas behind the stomach and you notice that the video is slightly sped up and edited to make it uh, less tedious and boring to watch. Now that we've got all of that omentum separated from the stomach, you can see how big the stomach is, how long the stomach is, we can get ready to uh, place our stapling device 
um, on the stomach and begin the resection of the outer part of the stomach. The first staple load is done without a sizing tube in place to get things started. The next load goes in but before it's fired we're going to run a, a sizing tube down which you'll see come down in a second. We keep checking front and back releasing that fat allows us to look front and back to make sure that we're not um, leaving too much stomach behind or indeed taking too much stomach with us and that there are no folds to the stomach as we take the uh, staple uh, through. You can see that the stapler fires three rows of staples either side of the blade to achieve its effect of cutting through and sealing the stomach as we go through. So there's no spillage of stomach contents and importantly we're trying to prevent a leak from the uh, remnant stomach side. You can see the jiggle from the anaesthetist there of the tube to make sure that we haven't caught it up somehow and now we can continue firing up through with the staples. At the top we're most worried about leak and here I use a uh, reinforcement called a seam guard which helps to support the staple line and indeed prevent leak and bleeding from the staple line. I generally use that on the last two fires of the uh, staples. And this is the last fire now. The seam guard didn't come away with that uh, properly on that occasion and I cut the sutures to help remove it. We then take the stomach that we're going to remove and put it out of the way before sewing down the staple line. And here you can see the first part of the sewing where the fat's poured on and sewn directly onto the staple line using the sutures to reinforce the staples, bringing the fat on to help with healing and try and prevent leakage. The uh, sewing of the staple line also helps to prevent any bleeding that might occur through the staple line and the sewing the fat on helps to prevent any twisting uh, or turning of the uh, remnant stomach that could lead to kinking and uh, narrowing later on. You can see here's an area that was bleeding and now we've stitched it up and the bleeding stops. This suturing I continue all the way to the bottom uh, before finishing and cutting that suture off. It's a special suture which has some little barbs to it that stop it being able to be pulled back and that means we don't have to tie it. Now we've got the stomach that we're planning to remove. We snare it up with a little uh, uh, suture snare and then pass a bag inside the uh, abdomen to pop the stomach in there so that we can bring it out through a very small incision. The reason I use that little suture snare is I want to make sure that one end rather than the middle of the stomach comes out first and that helps me to uh, be able to deliver it that way as you'll see in a moment. At this point we've got the bag delivered and we can open that bag up much like opening a purse and then there's that little bit of stomach that we want to deliver first and we'll pull that out like a ribbon from a magician's hat quite frequently because I keep the cut small the stomach will tear as it did on that occasion and we'll need to take it out in two or three pieces nonetheless it's all achievable through a fairly small cut after a few minutes of work we're able to pop the whole thing out and remove it the sutures uh, then placed in the abdomen and we're done after the surgery is complete the patient is taken to recovery where we concentrate on getting nausea and pain under control before transferring them to the ward. While on the ward, patients can sip water and chew ice that first day, but really it's not about trying to swallow too much. The stomach will feel very tight after the surgery. The next day, the stomach starts to open up a little and will accept perhaps a glass of water all day, but it's done in slow sips. The following night, the stomach seems to open up quite a lot for most patients, and by the next morning they're able to drink enough to survive and keep up with their hydration needs. And so long as there are no medical concerns, they're able to be discharged from hospital. They'll generally stay on a very thin fluid diet, which means fluids that can be drunk through a popper juice type straw for five or six days. Once they're drinking those thin fluids freely, they're ready to move to thickened fluids. Thickened fluids are a consistency of puree. People stay on the puree uh, diet for about two to three weeks. Following that, they move through sloppy and soft food, 
And finally, they move to harder foods that require chewing. It's advisable to sit down every time that you're taking food so that you can remember to chew your food well so nothing gets stuck in that period. I describe the post-operative diet as a little bit like the phases that a baby goes through where they start with liquids and eventually get teeth that they can chew with. And if you keep that in mind, it's a fairly logical progression, but your nutritionist and or dietitian will help you with this as well as your surgeon. Well, that's all I've got for this video. I hope you found it helpful. Uh, please visit my website if you'd like more information.